Unlocked is brought to you by Invincible, a program designed to unlock the potential of people and teams inside your organization. Join companies like Pfizer, Delta, the CDC, Google, and Chick-fil-A and others in over 116 countries that are currently using this program to increase productivity and develop healthy cultures. Access hundreds of hours of content that is accessible anytime, anywhere. And finally, use real-time data to understand the health of every team inside your organization, which teams are performing and which ones aren't. Then understand the why behind that performance. Get free access to Invincible for 30 days by visiting www.giant.tv slash 30 days. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Unlocked, where we talk about unlocking the potential of people so that we can unlock the potential of our organizations. Today, I've got Jim Kerr, one of the foremost thought leaders on culture development. He's worked with a ton of different organizations, big and small, and he has a lot of experience in this world. He has just released a book called Indispensable. And in that book, he lays out six core components of being an indispensable organization, one that your customers can't live without. And I love that connection between company culture and customers not being able to live without them, right? So there is a direct connection. And if you haven't figured that out yet, then listen to this interview with Jim and you'll start to understand why those components are so important. So he lays out these six components, talks about how they're connected, talks about why they're important. And it's it's really, really great to hear from a thought leader like him. He's appeared in Fast Company, in Business Week, in Bloomberg. Um, so there's there's some really good insights in here that I would love for you to pay attention to. Get ready. We're going to go ahead and start this interview. Let's roll. All right, Jim, welcome to the show. We're excited to have you. And you have a new book that just launched there behind you called Indispensable, uh, Build and Lead a Company Customers Can't Live Without. So you are super focused on the culture of an organization, but you're talking about building and leading a company customers can't live without. So um, I love that mostly because I come from a background of external marketing and brand and design and that world of sales. And, and now I'm focused a lot on the internal development of cultures and teams and communication styles. Tell me about that dynamic and why you're focusing on that customer word in conjunction with being indispensable as a company. Well, yes. Thanks for that question, Scott. And again, great to be here with you. Um, you know, as far as tying it all together, I, I think that the ultimate customer experience metric is, am I running a business that customers can't live without? Culture is an element of it. It's one of six that I talk about in the book. And I try to provide an agenda for leaders to follow in this book uh, that's based on 30 years of doing high-end management consulting work. And I've included the things that I saw work at some major companies. And I also talk about some things that didn't work so well and, and hopefully provide some lessons for folks to uh, learn by uh, as well. So culture is a centerpiece uh, of any good business, I believe. And it's all about behavior, right? So when we talk about culture, we're talking about how people actually operate and behave uh, within the organization. And that, that affects customer experience. It, it affects how people work as a team. Um, it determines results at the end of the day. Have you seen examples in maybe past client work or organizations you've, you've had a hand in where there was a poor customer experience because of the culture? 
Sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't want to name names um, here, but I will say this. If the culture isn't strong, if it doesn't define what good looks like, you're liable to get just about anything happening on the front lines. And we think about the customer experience, it's really delivered by those frontline uh, workers who are representing the brand and, and, you know, interacting with your customer base. So if you're not able to institutionalize a culture that's based on trust, that has all kinds of um, reinforcement of, of uh, the values of the organization and so on, there's no guarantee that you're going to get great um, behavior on the front end. People are going to just kind of do what they do. And um, sometimes the customer is going to suffer because of that lack of focus. I always talk about this, this thought of we, um, the people that we pay the least are the people we are trusting with our brand the most, yeah. you know, um, when you think about, you know, just your grocery store down the street, you know, how many of us are going to interact with, you know, we got Kroger down here. How many of us are going to interact with the CEO of Kroger or even know who the CEO of Kroger is, right? We're not, we're going to, we're, we're going to interact with that employee right. and right. that's, what's going to create our experience of that brand as we go Absolutely forward. Absolutely. Right. Right. And, and, you know, some of the work that I do with clients on this is it really starts with a vision and it's not just simple statement, you know, we will be the best grocery store chain to kind of riff off of your example. We'll be the greatest, you know, most uh, wonderful grocery store chain in the land. I mean, anybody that's in that business will have a similar kind of thought built into their vision statement. Uh, you need something more than that. You need a story. You need to help people understand uh, where they fit in. It's got to be compelling and engaging. Uh, that kid that sweeps the floor at night has to be, you know, feeling like they're part of something special and see how what they're doing and what their contribution is matters. And the only way you can convey that to people, I believe anyway, is through storytelling. So you've got to be able to define what wonderful grocery store chain looks like and go further and explain, here's how we work. These are the tools we use. These are the customers we support. This is how we support them, et cetera, et cetera. People have to be able to see themselves being successful within that story. So is this a little bit of what you talk about in the book? I mean, is the, do you hint at this type of thing? This um, You call it the indispensable paradigm and, and what that is. Can you, can you lay that out? What is the indispensable paradigm? How, how does that work? And how do you lay that out in the book for us? Yeah, Scott, thanks for that question. Uh, there's six elements to it. So the first one is leadership. And it's really about being able to create a leadership philosophy that's engaging, that's inclusive, that's transparent, and so on. The second piece, uh, of course, is the vision. So it's kind of what I said, you've, you've got to be able to provide a compelling vision that people want to be part of, something that they can rally around. The third part is um, the culture. How do we get people to behave in a way that enables um, success in the organization, that enables the leadership team to achieve the vision that they've laid out? The fourth piece is people. And it's there that you need to be able to get the right people and align them around what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then the next piece uh, is, is really about trust. You've got to be able to build trust so that you can empower people to do the right things. Again, sort of using your example of, of the uh, grocery store, people have to know what good customer service looks like and then they'll be able to provide that to the, to your customers. So it's, it's get, being able to build trust and empower people to do the right thing. And then the last component, and this is one that often gets forgotten, but it's the idea of being able to introduce a change framework that's repeatable so that whenever we introduce change, whenever we're trying to make something work a little differently, we do them in a very consistent way. So people aren't reinventing you know, the project every time there is one. Um, because change is happening all the time and we've got to be able to introduce it in a consistent way that people can recognize and they know how to implement change. And that's sort of the last component. So it's those six pieces that make up the paradigm. And if you do those things excellently, 
you will build an indispensable business, one your customers can't live without. If you're weak on any one of those, you've got work to do because you need all six to, to interoperate, to, to be able to, to really be integrated in a way that delivers this wow experience. That is interesting. So leadership, vision, culture, people, trust, and then that change framework. Right. Um, do you need to do them in that order? No, and, and I'm, again, great question, Scott. The, the uh, reality of the situation is you're, you're doing all these things all the time. So they're, they're really in kind of parallel. Um, you're adjusting uh, across all six of those domains, depending on what's going on in your marketplace, the challenges your particular business has, and so on. So there's adjustments being made across across the board. I mean, if there were an order of events, you know, obviously the vision becomes something that becomes critical, but you need the right leadership. Um, culture is important, but you need the right people. Um, trust can only be had if I've, and, you know, um, empowered people, if I've prepared people for what's needed, you know, that kind of thing. So they, they're, they're interdependent, but there's not a particular order. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I get, we, we should all be working on these things all the time. So that, yeah. that does make, make total sense. Um, is there some way that we can measure this stuff or kind of understand what we're not doing so well in or what we think we are doing well in? Maybe we need an awakening in some areas. <laughs> so like, how, how do we go about evaluating that to understand what we need to do and focus on? Sure. I, you know, the, the thing that um, I'm promoting right now, it's kind of a, a tag, a tag behind for the book is the rapid audit series. Like, and you can kind of see the signage behind me, but the, the notion is that you can audit yourself across those six dimensions of indispensability and be able to determine pretty quickly where there's weak spots. And then depending on the outcome of that audit, you can apply focus and, and be deliberate about improving those particular areas. What my experience has been with a lot of the clients that I work with, and keep in mind, I kind of work with the upper middle market up through the Fortune 250. So they're bigger companies, they've got bigger budgets, there's thousands of people uh, that work in those businesses. So when we introduce a change or a transformation effort, it's pretty big. You know, it, it spans across geographies in many cases. So you've got to be able to kind of quickly assess where are we today across any of those six things in order to build the, the right kind of program to make adjustments, to improve on those, to transform them. Is there any one of those that you find that people are generally weaker in across the board? Like, is there, is there one that always kind of ticks lower than others? You know, again, uh, interesting question. I, I would say this about it. I, I think it's totally situational. So some places come in and they've got a very rigorous strategy and, and, um, plan for execution, but they may be really weak on culture. They may not have aligned the culture with what they're trying to achieve as a business. Another place might have a wonderful culture and everyone gets along and it's transparent and it's, you know, highly effective teams, but they don't have a vision story. So they're doing good work as they understand what good is but it's hard for an individual employee sitting in a cube someplace to, to completely feel comfortable that they're doing the right thing all the time because no one's told them what the overarching you know, vision is, what we're trying to achieve. So um, it, it varies from place to place. I would say this though, and just kind of riffing off your question a little bit more, Scott, I would say that the vision storytelling is one that I see uh, a lot of resistance to. And I think part of that comes from sort of the old line leadership philosophy that says all oh, that touchy feely stuff is motherhood and apple pie and there's no real value uh, in, in spending time there. But I would argue that if you don't tell people what you're trying to accomplish, how do you expect them to accomplish it? 
right? So they, they need a, they need something that they can relate to and understand and sort of live by. And that's where the vision stuff comes into play. Totally agree. I mean, just in, in my world of, uh, in the marketing world, but also doing brand strategy for companies for a long time. It's like, I've, I've tended to gravitate towards the, the, I guess, things you can't touch, right? Like I haven't grabbed, I haven't done the, the, the advertising type work, right? The direct ROI from this day to that day. Like I can't see how many people bought something from one day to the next, but I'm into creating a long-term strategy for organizations internally and externally. And I have felt that too. I think that, you know, we're so, um, I guess, short-term focused, mm. right? That we get in this mode of, well, if I can't see results in three days, then why am I doing this? Right, right. You know? And yep. uh, what happens is that it, it does affect the people. So I saw, I saw this other um, chart by Simon Sinek posted this thing where he's got on his Y-axis, he's got money, right? So growth of a company. And then on the X-axis is time. And he's got two lines. He's got a Y line. Like he's always the start with Y guy, right? The purpose, the vision, the story. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and it's going up. And then your what line, like the thing that you do every day. And he's got both lines going in parallel at the beginning. Over time though, once you get to a certain size where your revenue grows, your why, because you get so big, you start to not focus anymore on the people you're not getting people anymore that believe what you believe that'll take a pay cut to build this dream, to build this vision. And now you're just hiring people to keep the ship running and to keep right. making the widgets. So your why planes off over time, but your what keeps going up. Now you're hiring people just to do a what job where there's no buy-in, there's no passion. There's no, I'm just making this thing and I don't really know why I'm doing it. I'm just doing it. Right. Yeah. I, it's great. Great. Uh, <sighs> Point. I mean, you know, what we tend to do on the, the kind of work that I get brought in to help with is we revitalize an organization typically uh, from the vision standpoint. And then that drives down into other transformational efforts where we can come in and say, okay, we're going to change the way we manufacture this product. So that gets into transformation and process design and all that stuff, which I also help with, right? But without a vision, to be sort of that true north, it's almost impossible to make the right guess at what you need to do next. So helping people understand the why is, I think it starts as soon as a new uh, hire walks in the door. It's gotta be part of an assimilation program that you drive that helps people really understand not only what business you're in, but why you're there and how they fit and this is absolutely critical, how they fit and will make a difference in helping the business su succeed. And then what happens for them? What do they get when the business succeeds? You know, so there's that kind of thing that I, to your point, I think we often lose. And then it's guys like me that kind of come in and help a leadership team um, kind of resurrect that and promote it again and, and, and kind of center the organization. Really good. Um, you end your book using this phrase, keep it real, right? What's that about? <laughs> why, why do you end the book that way? And what's that have yeah. to do with being an indispensable organization? Yeah. You know, Scott, the, the thing is I will have taken the reader from beginning to end through the book and I've outlined the six sort of main pieces, right? By the time you get to the end of the book, the last reminder, if you will, is to be you. You still have to be you as a leader. So I'm writing to that leadership audience, whether they're an emerging leader that's just sort of early in their career or you know, the stodgy veteran that's about to retire. If you're reading this book and you're buying into the model that I've outlined, you also have to remember to be authentic. And if you're not, I think you know, people can see through disingenuous people. It's one of the tools that we have as human beings walking on this planet, right? Is to be able to, to um, you know, understand that. And I think disingenuous leaders fail. So if you're going to 
pull this off, you've got to be real. You've got to do it your way. You've got to um, help people see who you really are. You know, warts and blemishes include all the great things you are as a leader, but also all the warts and blemishes that, that every human being has. And, and show that vulnerability. And I think by doing that, you gain followership. And that's so critical in trying to pull off any big thing. You've got to have a team of people there all working together to make it happen. So we see that a lot in, uh, we're seeing that a lot, I guess I will say in the external marketing world, right? I mean, the emergence of social media created this vibe of inauthenticity, yeah. this, this cloak of I'm only, you're only catching me at the one second of my best day. And now everybody thinks my life is amazing. Right. When, and now we look at that, we're like, uh, that's, that's not real. You know, advertisements, um, the dove campaign with yeah. women Photoshopping things, right? Like there's this authenticity that's starting to come out now with, with corporations wanting to appeal to that market. So right. we look at that from the external standpoint, we can learn something about our internal cultures, right? Yeah. And say, well, that mindset does it change, right? When we're dealing with internal culture and leadership and people, like it's the same, the same people buying things externally are the same people that are buying into a company vision, buying into right. what I do every day. And right. so that's, that's critical to understand for organizations when they're building those, those uh, visions. Yeah, you know, absolutely. The, the thing is, we all want to be part of something bigger than ourselves, right? There, there's a reason that we go to church. There's a reason we're part of our communities. There's a reason we join clubs. And hopefully there's a reason why we join companies. And I think it's on leadership's um, uh, back. It's, on, it's, a, it's a responsibility of top leaders to provide that vision that people can buy into and want to be part of. It's as much uh, community building as any other thing you could be doing in your life. So for me, yeah, we've got to be able to provide that. And we have to deliver it in an authentic way so that people believe it. If they don't believe you, then there's going to be a trust issue. And guess what? That's one of the six parts of the indispensable paradigm. Now you've got a trust issue you've got to fix uh, and so on. So there, there's all, they're all these six parts are all connected. It's like I say, it's based on 30 years of doing this kind of work with some, some of the biggest organizations on the planet and seeing what worked and what didn't work. Okay. That makes sense. I see what, I see what you did there, bringing it back to trust and how the six, I, so that's cool. Like I, that's <laughs> interesting to see that be put into action, right? It's like, Oh yeah, that's a trust issue. Right. And that comes back to being an indispensable organization. So totally get it, man. Totally makes sense. It's really cool. One of the things you say is, is the biggest mistakes that companies make when building company culture is not being deliberate when they're yeah. building their company culture. Yeah, right. I mean, there's a, a, a six step process that I outline in the book um, that walks a company through resetting their culture deliberately. So it sort of starts with a strategic framework. What are we trying to accomplish and so on? Then it goes to a baseline. Where are we today across the, the cultural dynamics? Then it goes into a vision. You know, what's our vision for the future culture of the organization? And then a gap analysis, determine the difference between where we are today as, in, as defined in the baseline and where we want to be as defined in the vision. And then translate those projects or translate those gaps into projects and programs. That's sort of the fifth step of the approach. And then lay it all out in a timeline and make sure you create a governance model to maintain the set of initiatives you've identified so that you can evolve through implementation of those things to the culture you've defined. So it's a way to help companies be focused on and specific to improving their cultures so it's a it's a tried and true methodology i've literally done it probably a couple dozen times with with varying companies the biggest was part of the marine corps though some of the smaller ones are startups that have brought me in to help them get going on a on the right track so you know it works and and i provide plenty of examples in that chapter in the book that shows just exactly what each one of those six parts uh, of the methodology delivers to an organization. Very cool. Where can people get a hold of the book? 
Well, you know, it's available at your favorite bookstores uh, for sure. So if you're ordering online, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Bookshop, and there's even bulk orders that have set up through my website that it will allow you to get, you know, deep discounts if you're ordering a bunch of books. What I'm finding is a lot of organizations are actually buying dozens of copies and they're doing it, kind of using it in a couple of different ways. They're using it as part of a training. Sometimes they're using it in lieu of training. <laughs> Sometimes they're hosting their own sort of uh, book clubs. So they're giving it to, to staffers to read and then the staffers come together and talk about it. And I know this because I'm starting to get invited to, to speak at some of these book club kind of things and some of these training kind of things um, that's centered around indispensable. So, so there's all different ways to buy it and all different kinds of, of um, good you know, options for you if you want to buy in bulk. Very cool. And if people buy your book, I'm going to put a link in the show notes where people can actually fill out a form. Yeah. Registration and form. And what that gives them ac access to Scott is the six parts of this rapid audit series. That's kind of shining behind my head here. Uh, it's a six part video, one for each of the six parts of indispensable. Right. And it's a, a short sort of, of uh, video that lets you, self audit across those six dimensions of indispensability. And then it kind of gives you a score. It helps you understand where you, what you're doing well and should continue to do and where there might be some weak spots that need your attention. Awesome. I love audits. Audits are awesome, but if we don't yeah. do anything with them, then they're pointless. Right. So, yeah, well, that's, um, <laughs> that's true enough. <laughs> so, so I love that. So you're giving people the, the free videos, free access to the ind indispensable audit, but they got to buy the book and then fill out the form and then they'll get right. access to that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and all I'm asking for there is some sort of a re receipt number. So if you place okay. your order online, cut and paste the receipt number in there, that's part of the registration form. And then bingo, you get brought to a page and it's all right there. There's no downloading or anything you have to do. You'll just uh, have access to the content. Beautiful. And how can other people get in touch with you if they want you to come speak at their their book club? Yeah, well, I'm on LinkedIn, right? Um, and I don't know, Scott, will we be able to provide some of the links in this? Yeah, stuff you, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put all those links in the show notes. I'll put your okay. social channels and your bio all, right. all there so people can uh, find out more about you. Yeah, there. for sure. So you'll you'll see links. And, and my website's really pretty simple. It's indispensable-consulting.com. So you can always get in through there and, and send a note or give me a call. And it'd be, be great to talk about this kind of stuff with anybody that's um, you know, wants to build a company that customers can't live without. <laughs> Beautiful, Jim. I love it, man. Great conversation and good yeah. luck with the book launch and everything's going. This is your sixth book. So, uh, you know, you're becoming pretty good at this. So, um, <laughs> you know. Well. But, I don't know about that, but yeah, it is my sixth book. <laughs> yeah. Well, very cool. Um, excited for you and good luck with the launch. And thanks for being on the show and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you, Scott. It was really a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay. Did you get those six steps to becoming indispensable? It starts with leadership. Then it goes into vision. Then we start working on culture. Then we develop people. Then we build trust and then we work in what happens when we have change and building that change framework because change, change is always happening. Organizations are always changing. And how do we adapt all those things that we've done? We put a lot of work into those other components and we don't want to you know, crush all the work we've done with change. Uh, we have to understand change and what it means. I love how Jim talked about the vision story and that buy-in, you know me, right? I'm, I'm a brand guy. I love vision. I love the storytelling aspect of what a company is all about. That's how we get customers, clients, employees, and team members to buy in to us as an organization. We want to buy from companies that believe what we believe. We want to belong to companies that believe what we believe. And that is what's going to drive us as individuals, and that's what's going to drive us as organizations. So it's going to unlock us. And that's what's going to unlock 
our organizations. See what I did there. All right. So thank you, Jim. Good luck with the book. Everybody get that indispensable audit. That's it's that's a great gift. Um, you got to get the book and then you can fill out that form. And in the show notes, I'll have that uh, that link there where you can fill out that form. So get in touch with Jim. He's got some information that he can share with you. Um, for a speaking engagement or anything else that you're doing there. If you want more information on me, you can go to scottwaldron.com. You can also visit my YouTube channel, like, subscribe, share, do all those things that you do on YouTube. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I would love to connect with you there. All right, everybody. Thank you for uh, watching and listening to this episode. I will see you next time on Unlocked.